Well, we're excited to be in this series we've been calling Not of This World, looking at a practical guide for uncommon living. Last week, we looked at this amazing truth about Jesus not being ashamed to call us his holy brothers and sisters. Let me ask you, how has that idea changed the way that you relate to God? Have any of you thought about that this week? That Jesus calls you not just his friend, not just his beloved, but his brother and his sister. How might that idea radically change or shift the way that we think about him? I know I've been thinking about it all week long. And today we're going to pick up right where we left off in Hebrews chapter 3, beginning in verses 1 through 2. We're not going to do very many verses today, but we're going to start right where we left off in Hebrews 3. It's going to be on the screen for you, I hope. (laughs) In verse 1, it says this, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in this heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. I want you to underline that today if you're taking notes or highlight that in your Bible app. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we as the people of God acknowledge as our apostle and our high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. The title of my message today is Fix Your Thoughts. Fix Your Thoughts. I wanna look at this morning a couple practical ways that we can fix our thoughts on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Anyone ever seen that show, Fixer Upper? You guys know that show with uh, Chip and Joanna Gaines. It's been out for a while. It's kind of a popular show. It's a cool show. Anybody into home renovation or you just like to dream about the day that you'll maybe be able to afford a home that you can renovate? (laughs) I remember dreaming about owning a home and then now I own one and all I have to do is pay to fix it up all the time. (laughs) Phil knows what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about today. Dumping all this money into a home to renovate it. Why? Because it needs fixing. It's broken down. It needs restoration. And for some of you, I didn't just describe your home life, I described your thought life today. Broken down, in need of restoration. Jesus wants to encourage us. He wants to challenge us to fix our thoughts on Jesus. It's a little bit of a play on words today. So what's the premise? Well, your thoughts define who you become. Paul actually says, if you want to experience real life change and transformation, am I talking to anybody today that wants to experience real life change and transformation? Well, he says this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, don't copy the behaviors and the patterns or customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. Say a new person. A new person by changing the way you look, changing the way you dress, buying a new car, changing your job. Come on, millennials and Gen Zers. The stats aren't good. We change our jobs every five to six months. It's crazy. No, not by changing any of those things, but by changing the way that you think. How do we experience transformation? The answer is by changing our thoughts. Today we're going to look at this. We're going to look at how we can actually fix our thought life. So how do we do this? Number one, fixing your thoughts begins when you fix your aim. Fixing your thoughts begins when you fix your aim. Regarding our aim, listen to what the Apostle Paul has to say to his church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 26. It says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Therefore, run in such a way that you may win, because everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath or prize. Back in the day, right? You guys remember the Olympics? The Greco-Roman days when people would compete, they would receive a prize, and it was a wreath, a little crown that they would put on their head. And Paul says, this is an imperishable, or he says, this is a perishable wreath, but we are going to receive an imperishable crown, a crown of glory. Amen? Therefore, he says in verse 26, and here's the point, run in such a way as not without aim. So let me ask you to start today, what are you aiming at? What are you aiming for? Back when I was a 
a child in middle school, seventh and eighth grade, they used to let kids do archery. They actually taught archery class in public school back in the day. They somehow thought it was a good idea to let a whole bunch of seventh and eighth graders have bows and arrows. <laughs> yep, the 90s were awesome. <laughs> that is until one of them shot the teacher and they literally had to cancel the class. <laughs> I was there actually the very next day. They're like, archery is closed from here forth. <laughs> but before they banned it, I remember, one of the, the, the distinguishing things I remembered about that class was, was spending so much time aiming my shoulder at the target. In fact, we spent most of our time in class not always really shooting arrows, but learning how to aim. And so they would get our feet pointed in the right direction, and then we'd get our shoulders pointed in the right direction. And for those of you that are bow hunters, I'm going to murder this, so please give me grace today, Phil, or whoever's watching online, Garrett, my, my buddies from afar. But you spend time learning how to draw the bow, lining up your shoulders, having the right posture, getting into the right position, learning the right techniques so that you can aim at the target, at the target. So we spend a lot of our time fixing our aim because you can't fix what you're not aiming at. Can I say that again for some of you today? You can't fix what you're not aiming at. If there are things that are wrong in your life, you gotta address them. Some of us are not aimed at the right target and then we get discouraged because we're not achieving the right outcomes because the truth is we need to fix our aim. We need to fix our aim. So what are you aiming at this morning? Or for those of you that are listening or watching this online, what are you aiming at? Is money? And success your target? Is power and status your target? Is pleasure or sex your target? Is glory and fame your target? How about comfort or convenience? What are you aiming at? The old saying is that the target draws the arrow. The target draws the arrow. The truth is whatever target you're aiming at will draw the arrow of your life's attention and focus. That's good, Pastor Jay, say it again. Whatever you're aiming at will draw the arrow of your life's attention and focus. So if I'm not even looking at Jesus, who's supposed to be the author and the finisher and perfecter of our faith, the target of our faith, why then am I so disappointed with the results of my life and how they don't match up with what God's promised me in his word? Why am I so disappointed when I'm not achieving the things that I feel like the Lord has for me? It may be that you need to fix your aim. Listen to what Psalm 4.2 says. It says this, Oh, sons or daughters of man, how long will my honor become a reproach? How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Some of us are really disappointed with God right now, but the truth is we've been aiming at all the wrong things. And then we expect God to come and fix our mess. It might just be that our aim's off. Maybe. <laughs> Today he might be saying to some of you, you need to fix your sights on Jesus. You need to fix and adjust in your life. Maybe beginning with your attitude. What are you aiming at? What are you shooting for? Simply put, you might need a new target. At Courageous Church, this is why we emphasize God's word as our primary target because it centers us, it aligns us, it directs our attention and our thoughts toward things that actually matter. It helps us connect our aim with the things, or we can even say the new things that God wants us to think about or even focus on. Philippians 4 verse eight reiterates this point. Listen to what Paul says. He says, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about these things, things that are excellent and worthy of praise. This is what we're called to fix our aim on. So, number one today, you gotta fix your aim. You gotta fix what you're aiming at. And number two, for those that are still with me, you need to fix your focus. Right now, in the back of this room, 
There's a camera. You can turn around and see it. And it is pointed. It is aimed at the stage. It's, it's aimed at me. I'm the target. The platform is the target. And typically every week we go back and set that up, or at least a team member helps me set that up. And it's aimed at the person that it's supposed to be focused on. But there's one more step besides getting it set up and pointing it in the right direction. Somebody actually has to go back there and manually adjust the focus. Because it's aimed at the right direction, but unless someone focuses the lens, it's still blurry. And for some of you, you might be aimed at some of the right things, but your vision is blurry. Your focus is off. You're looking through a foggy or dirty lens today, and it needs to be realigned and adjusted by the power of the Holy Spirit. I wonder if as a church, we might become a kind, the kinds of people that would welcome the Spirit's help to adjust our focus so that we can see things more clearly than ever. For some of you that wear glasses or prescription glasses, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right, you, you put on what are called corrective lenses. And what are those lenses doing? They're, they're helping correct or realign your focus so that you can see clearly, amen? The good news is that not only is God's word a better target for us, it's also a better lens. It's also a better lens. It'll help us see life as it is and should be. The problem with our culture right now, the problem with what, what I see in our culture right now is that many people are trying to view life through a distorted, corrupted, and polluted lens. And, and what is the lens of the, the world? It's, it's sin, it's death, and it's the devil. Your friends and neighbors, and those that you care about in this world are looking at the world through a corrupted lens, through a faulty lens, through a distorted lens. Lens, which is why our goal as the people of God shouldn't be just to win arguments. Our goal should be to give people a better lens. My friends, Jesus is that better lens. Jesus is that better lens. When you put on Christ, you put on clarity. When you put on Christ, you see things the way they really are. When you put on Christ, you put off, or Paul says, throw off the old self with all of its distorted ways. Listen to what he says here in Ephesians chapter four, verse 17 through 22. In the NLT, I like the way it says it. It says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. For some of you, that's just something you need to grab a hold of. Live no longer as the Gentiles do, those that don't have a covenant with God. For they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of what? Darkness. And they wander from the life that God gives because they have closed their minds and they have hardened their hearts against God. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Verse 20, but that isn't what you've learned about Christ, church. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, Throw off or cast away your old sinful nature and your former way of doing life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, renew your thoughts and your attitudes. And finally, put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Isn't that good? So I want to illustrate this point for us today. I'm going to do my best. How many of you know that you can't put on something until you've rightly taken something else off? Okay, well, I'll show you what I mean. This is some of you today. And you're walking around with a blindfold on and you can't see anything. All you know is darkness. All you know is this reality of lust, corruption, deception, perversion, deceit, despair, hopelessness. And you're walking around with a blindfold on 
And you're fumbling into things and you're crashing into stuff and you're, you're on the precipice of something that you're about to fall off into. The devil planned and prepared for you and your destruction. You're blinded. You're in the dark. And what you need is the light of Christ to come and to remove the blindfold off your eyes. To remove the blinders from your eyes. To break the power of the God of this world's stronghold over your life. Because of the lies you've been believing or the life you've been leading. Now for some of you, this is you, but you've heard the message of Christ. You've heard the truth. And you've welcomed it into your life. But instead of taking the blindfold off and putting away the lust and the deception and the lies and the hiding and the shame, you've tried to add Christ to your life. And this is you. You got the lens of Christ on, but you're still blinded. You're still walking around in the dark. And things are a little clear, but they're still foggy and dark because you just don't want to let go of the blindfold. The blindfold comforts you. It tells you things like, oh, you can live with me. Nobody has to know about your porn habit or addiction. It's not that big of a deal. No one needs to know that you secretly wrestle with anger. It's not that big of a deal. You, you got the light of Christ on, right? Wrong. You're still blinded. And what you need to do is you need to allow God, to remove the blindfold so that you can put on Christ and see. Wow, look at all these beautiful people. So gorgeous. Look at all this color. I can see. Wow. Right? That's the invitation today, church to not mix darkness with light. That's called syncretism. That's called friendship with the world. That's called trying to have it your way. No, but to put on the light of Christ and let him be the lens through which you focus your thoughts, through which you fix your aim. That's the invitation this morning. For some of us, we've lived this way for so long some of you maybe got one eye blinded, <laughs> that it's become normal. We think this is just our struggle. This is just our cross to bear. There's, there's no hope or freedom for me. I just want to stand in the, the midst of that gap today and tell you there is hope and freedom available for you in Christ Jesus. There is hope on the other side of what you're struggling with. There is redemption and restoration for every marriage in this room, everybody that's wrestling with things right now we got to put on Christ and Christ alone and let him illuminate the darkness. Let him invite us to bring our skeletons out of the closet and to let them dance at the party. That was awful. Please don't ever do that again, Pastor Jason. <laughs> For some of you, you've been aiming at the wrong target and God wants to help you fix that today. For some of you, you've been living life out of focus and God wants to help adjust that today. But either way, his invitation for us is to come out of the darkness and into the light. And I pray for you today. God, I thank you that in this room and watching this online all over the world or listening to this podcast, there are people for whom you gave your life to set them free. And your word says, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. And Lord, sometimes we look at that verse in that passage and we go, but how could that be my reality? How could that be my life? When all I've known is bondage, all I've known is slavery, all I've known is darkness. God, would you come now and open up the windows and pull back the shutters and let the light in? Jesus, would you be the lens through which we see the world and see ourselves and rightfully see our sin nailed to that cross and forever done away with, never to be heard about again? And when the enemy comes knocking and offers us the blindfold, we say, no thanks, we're forgiven and free. God, for anybody wrestling with that, feeling the struggle, the pull between addiction and freedom, God, would you just come and rescue them today? 
Perhaps maybe for you, it's just opening up your mouth and beginning to praise him like Paul did when he, when he was in the jail. The Bible says that when Paul and Silas were praying and rejoicing at the midnight hour, God opened up the jail cell and Paul and Silas and others went free. Your freedom is connected to others going free today. And so as much as God cares about you, he also cares about your spouse and your boyfriend and your girlfriend and your parents and your brothers and your sisters and your cousins and your friends and your aunts and your uncles and your coworkers and your boss. He cares about others. Would you say yes to Jesus today? Let him turn on the light for you. So God, would you do that this morning for anybody in need of that this morning? Lord, help us as we walk through this life to not get distracted, to not lose our focus, to not lose our aim. Jesus, we wanna fix our thoughts on you, on whatever is true and noble and of good report, whatever is excellent and worthy of praise. Help us today.